Armstrong, and this is VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. There's Thompson and Brian Lynn. Dan Novak's story looks at the health problems that have come up in Ethiopia due to the country's civil war. Many children who would have received vaccines by now are missing out. After that, Ashley discusses work being done by a national safety organization in the U.S. It is trying to create a system that can check drivers for alcohol use before they get in a car. Following Ashley, get your binoculars ready. Brian Lynn looks at a new online guide that follows the travel path or migration of 450 bird species in the Americas. Then, Andrew Smith and Jill Robbins have information international students will not want to miss. Do you know how to participate in a university class? At the end of today's show, you will hear Ana Mateo with this week's Words and Their Stories. Her weekly feature is a reliable way to learn English. Some might call it tried and true. And now, here's Dan Novak. Deadly diseases like measles, tetanus, and whooping cough are on the rise in Ethiopia's Tigray area. Vaccination rates have fallen sharply there during the almost two-year-long civil war. The percentage of children receiving usual vaccinations has fallen below 10% this year, data from the Tigray Health Bureau shows. That has undone years of government efforts to increase vaccination rates. The hopes of the children in the region to grow healthier and happier were snatched away in the blink of an eye, the agency wrote in a letter this month to the international vaccine group Gavi. The letter said attacks on Tigray by Ethiopian government forces led to supply shortages that reduced the number of vaccinations. The Tigray agency also wrote that power outages have disrupted vaccine supply chains. The agency added that it is difficult for people in rural areas to get to health centers. A ceasefire from March to late August made it possible for foreign medical aid to enter the area. But humanitarian access has been suspended since fighting began again, UN human rights experts said Monday. The experts said in a report that they had reason to believe that the denial of access to health care and other aid by federal officials is a crime against humanity. Ethiopian government officials did not immediately respond to requests for comment about the UN report. The government has denied blocking aid and says the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, the party leading the area government, is responsible for the conflict. The fighting has killed thousands of civilians in Tigray. Health Minister Leah Tadisi said vaccines had been provided to Tigray this year. She said that more were ready to be provided once conditions improved. In its letter, the Tigray Health Bureau said the percentage of children receiving the full dosage of vaccines had dropped to very low levels. Vaccination rates against several diseases, including whooping cough, tetanus, and hepatitis B, dropped from 99.3% in 2020 to 36% in 2021. This year, the vaccination rate is 7%. 
The rate across Ethiopia was 65% in 2021, said the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF. The letter also reports a drop in percentages of children being vaccinated against tuberculosis and measles. The vaccination rate was above 90% in 2020 and is below 10% this year. The letter said measles have spread in 10 of Tigray's 35 districts since the war began. The nonprofit organization Gavi pays for and ships vaccines to developing countries. It said it had provided measles and COVID-19 vaccines during the ceasefire in Tigray, but that some activities had been suspended since fighting began again. Ethiopia's LIA said 860,000 doses of measles vaccines were sent to Tigray last December, and more doses were provided on April 2nd. And she said the UN World Food Program, or WFP, is delaying a planned transport of humanitarian aid into Tigray. But WFP spokesperson Claire Neville said the agency was waiting on approval from Ethiopia's government. Without the clearances, she said, life-saving humanitarian supplies, including food, nutrition, and medical items, will have to be on hold. I'm Dan Novak. The National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, is recommending that all new vehicles in the United States have blood alcohol monitoring systems. The systems are designed to stop people who have had too much to drink from driving. If the recommendation is approved by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, it could reduce the number of alcohol-related crashes, one of the biggest causes of highway deaths in the United States. NHTSA said this week that road deaths in the U.S. are at crisis levels. Nearly 40,000 people were killed last year, the greatest number in 16 years, as Americans returned to the roads after pandemic stay-at-home orders. The agency says 11,654 people died in 2020 from alcohol-related crashes. That is the most recent year the data is available. That number represents about 30% of all U.S. traffic deaths. The NTSB, which has no legal power and can only ask other agencies to act, said the recommendation is designed to put pressure on NHTSA to take action. It could be effective as early as three years from now. We need NHTSA to act. We see the numbers, NTSB Chairman Jennifer Homendy said. We need to make sure that we're doing all we can to save lives. The NTSB, she said, has been pushing NHTSA to explore alcohol monitoring technology since 2012. The faster the technology is implemented, the more lives that will be saved, she said. The recommendation also calls for systems to monitor a driver's behavior, making sure they are paying attention or alert. She said many cars now have cameras pointed at the driver, which could possibly limit drunk driving. But Hamandi says she also understands that perfecting the alcohol tests will take time. We also know that it's going to take time for NHTSA to evaluate 
what technologies are available, and how to develop a standard, she said. The agency and a group of 16 automakers have been supporting research on alcohol monitoring since 2008. They formed a group called Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety. The group has hired a Swedish company to research technology that would automatically test a driver's breath for alcohol and stop a vehicle from moving if the driver has had too much to drink, said Jake McCook, spokesman for the group. The driver would not have to blow into a tube. Instead, a sensor would check the driver's breath, McCook said. Another company is working on light technology that could test for blood alcohol in a person's finger, he said. Breath technology could be ready by the end of 2024, while touch technology would come about a year later. It could take one or two more model years after car makers get the technology for it to be in new vehicles, McCook said. Once the technology is ready, it will take years for it to be in most of the cars on U.S. roads. Under last year's law to rebuild highways, the U.S. Congress required NHTSA to make automakers install alcohol monitoring systems within three years. The law does not name the exact technology only that it must passively monitor a driver to see if they are affected by alcohol. I'm Ashley Thompson. A new online bird guide documents the extraordinary paths of numerous species in the United States. The recently published guide is called the Bird Migration Explorer. It is a mapping tool created from a huge collection of scientific and community data. It covers the travel paths of about 450 bird species in the Americas. The guide, which is free to the public, is an ongoing project between 11 groups that collect and examine data on bird movements. Among them are the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS, Georgetown University, Colorado State University, and the National Audubon Society. For the first time, the online tool brings together online data from hundreds of scientific studies that use GPS markers to follow or track bird movements. The guide also includes more than 100 years of bird data collected by the USGS, community science observations, and genetic information of feathers. The past 20 years have seen a true renaissance in different technologies to track bird migrations around the world, said Peter Mara. He is a bird migration expert at Georgetown University who took part in the project. The online guide permits users to enter a species and then watch bird movements over the period of a year. For example, data from 378 tracked osprey birds show up as yellow dots that move between coastal North America and South America. Users can also enter the city where they live and choose another place on the map 
for a list of birds that migrate between the two areas. For example, ospreys, bobolinks, and at least twelve other species migrate between Washington D.C. and Fonchaboa, Brazil. Melanie Smith is the program director for the guide. She told the Associated Press that as new tracking data becomes available, the site will continue to expand. The next plan for expansion will add more data about seabirds. Michael Herrera lives in Washington D.C. and started bird watching about four months ago. He said the guide quickly became a favorite. It's almost like this hidden world that's right in front of your eyes, he said. Once you start paying attention, all these details that were like background noise suddenly have meaning. Georgetown's Mara hopes increasing public interest will help people understand the conservation difficulties currently facing birds. These include loss of natural environments and climate change. During the past fifty years, the population of birds in the U.S. and Canada has dropped nearly thirty percent. With migratory species facing some of the biggest drops, but some birds still make extraordinary trips. One example is the bay-breasted warbler, a small songbird. Two times a year, the bird flies nearly six thousand four hundred thirty-seven kilometers between Canadian forest. And its wintering grounds in northern South America. Jill Depp is the director of the Migratory Bird Program at the National Audubon Society. She told the AP she sees migratory birds as little globetrotters. I'm Brian Lynn. International students in the United States need to understand context and culture if they want to succeed in their studies. Experts say. Understanding context means knowing the situation in which something happens, and words that are being used in the specific situation. Dr. Susan Barone is the director of the English Language Center. At Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, the center provides English language training for international students. To explain how understanding context and culture relate to academic success, Barone talked about the word participation. Barone explained that for students in some parts of the world, participation means to listen carefully, while in other parts of the world. It may mean to speak quickly, often without waiting for others to speak first. She said that sometimes a student's expectation for participation is not the same as a professor's expectation. Dr. Barone said it's such a relative term. It's relative to each instructor. Each student will have their own understanding of what that means. How do they read the specific context for what the participation expectation is? Additionally, she said another difficulty for some international students is understanding idiomatic and conversational English used by American students. At Vanderbilt University, she noted that it is difficult even for international students with very high levels of academic English. So, what can international students do to better prepare before they arrive in the U.S.? Barone suggested that students think about all areas of their language ability beyond academic language. 
For example, students should pay attention to how well they can speak and understand daily conversations compared to how well they can write academic papers. Knowing their abilities, students can look for help once they are in the U.S. Support services exist at both large public universities and smaller private colleges. Since large public universities usually have more international students, it can be more difficult for them to provide individualized training, such as tutoring, to all international students. Barone added that international students should also learn vocabulary, expressions, and writing that are common in their field of study. For example, engineering students would communicate differently than those who study literature. Similarly, daily conversations involving sports or food will have their common language. Josh Teaster is the acting director of the admissions office of Oberlin College and Conservatory in the state of Ohio. He said the school has provided general English language support for its international students for many years. Recently, it has added support for English commonly used in music. He says this helps students succeed in their music studies and performance. But providing language training for international students is not the only way universities help them. Purdue University is a large state university in Indiana with 50,000 students, and 22% of them are international. One way the university attempts to help international students is to provide intercultural training for students in the U.S. For example, Purdue provides online training to help American students better understand accents from people around the world. Annette Benson works at Purdue's Center for Intercultural Learning, Mentorship, Assessment, and Research. In an email to Voice of America, she wrote that all students are expected to hone their listening skills to help them understand different accents. That way, International students are not the only group responsible for helping people understand them, Benson explained. Dr. Lan Jean is an intercultural research specialist at Purdue. She is Korean Chinese and has been living in both China and the U.S. Before working at Purdue, she was an international student there. Because of her own experience as an international student, she knows how important it is for students to deeply learn about the context they are in. While having international student friends is important, she wrote to VOA that international students should do their best to increase the time spent in groups of American students to learn about different cultures. Jean noted that in the U.S., students can meet individually with professors and talk to them about any difficulties they are having with their studies. This is different than in some cultures where it is more difficult for students to meet with professors. American colleges and universities also provide counseling for students including web-based counseling services. Jean explained that this is sometimes a good choice for international students who worry about being negatively judged when they look for mental health counseling. Jean advised international students to immerse or deeply involve themselves in local culture. Jean said, there are tons of opportunities and resources available in U.S. universities. Go explore, engage, and enjoy. Remember that this time in your life represents a real opportunity. Make the most of it. Barone from Vanderbilt said that students benefit when they have an open attitude. 
Being open means being more likely to try new things and speak with a variety of people. In this way, she said, the entire context becomes their classroom. From the moment they are immersed, there's opportunity to learn. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give examples and notes on usage. Today, we talk about things that are dependable. You can depend on them, and reliable. You can rely on them. These are things in life that we count on. We know they work because we have tried them. So today we talk about a word that describes such things: tried and true. Tried and true is an adjective. It describes a way of doing something that is proven to work well. Something tried and true is tested. Often we say a method or process is tried and true. It is trustworthy or worthy of your trust. If a method or way of doing something. Is tried and true. It could become your go-to way of doing something. You go to it often because you know it works. Go-to describes a method or process that has worked so well and so often that you count on it. A tried and true method is so dependable that it is a sure bet. You could even bet your life on it. What other words do we use with tried and true? A remedy or cure can be called tried and true. We can say a tried and true remedy works wonders, or works like a dream. A formula, an approach, a set of instructions. Basically, any way of doing something can be tried and true. Now let's hear two friends use this word and some related words. You look a little tired. Have you not been feeling well? No, I'm not sick. I haven't been sleeping well. You should try my tried and true remedy for getting better sleep. Sure. I'll try anything. I take a really long run about an hour before bedtime. Correction, I'll try anything, but that. Running may work wonders for you, but not for me. Do you have any other dependable go-to remedies? You could drink a cup of warm milk before bed. Now that sounds like my kind of remedy. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. We hope that VOA Learning English has become a tried and true way for you to learn English. Until next time, I'm Anna Mateo. Thank you, Anna. And that's the learning English broadcast for today. Thanks to my colleagues Dan Novak, Ashley Thompson, Andrew Smith, Jill Robbins, and Brian Lin. And thank you for listening. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to keep learning English with stories from around the world. I'm Dan Friedel.